I guess you would call me a horse of a different color. And sometimes I don't fit in society. I'm making my own trail in life. I, I'm not following anybody else's path. Eventually, this is going to be my house. In it, I've been able to find some great, wonderful things that mean things to me, and a lot of it revolves around death. But the hearse will sit right in the middle with all the coffins sitting around it, and just more for a showpiece, but then my toys. This is basically going to be my toy room. When I started liking the darker side, as it's referred to today, um, there were no bustiers, there were no techno music, there were no clubs or raves or any of this. It was that you just liked morbid things. So I always laugh today when I see them in their, their arrays and they're talking about this and that or that they drove through a cemetery or had their picture taken in a cemetery. I just laugh and I was like, you know, I was Grandma Goth. I did those things 40 years ago, but I did it for a different reason than they do it. Goth has gone to the point of being <laughs> too risque and the clothing has totally changed. Um, disfigurements as far as the tattoos and their, and their piercings. And it's nothing that they're doing that's becoming to them. I was looking for a building and had met a realtor and I said, I want a freaky kind of building that maybe I can put my business and live in at the same time. And he said, what about a church? I have a friend who sells churches. So he called, he said, I'll call you, give you a call. The next day he called me and it was raining and it was, the moon was out, but it was raining. And he said, sue this church. They've just signed a contract. They're gonna sell this church. It hasn't gone on the market. And he said, I think it would be advantageous for you to go over and take a look at it. And of course I drove by the front and I, you know, I fell in love with it. And it just seemed to me that she was just a lost lady. It was this beautiful structure, but nobody really cared for her, and it changed hands, and, and I can see when they did repairs, they patched her. They never really did what she needed. So, but I love it. I just think it's just a wonderful place for me. It's been very hard on the South Sherman Street block that I live on because first I showed up with purple hair, then we showed up with a horse trailer with 30 coffins put out in front as we were unloading, then they see coffins go in and out during Halloween, then they see a graveyard appear, but I'm quiet, I don't violate them, I try to maintain my property, I always speak to them, I'm very gracious, but I can't wait till my big fences go up, so I'm just kind of like encased in my world. I decided to build a little garden, and, and I had another friend who came by and said, I found a gravestone, would you like to have it? And remembering back east, most of all the churches had their graveyards next to, their, next to the churches. So I thought, well, we'll make it look like a graveyard. Then I planted some lilies in front of Mr. Chapman. I have Mr. Chapman's gravestone, I respect him. I usually plant flowers in front of his tombstone. All the people go up and down Sherman Street saying, look, my God. Or people say, is that a real grave? Is there somebody really buried there? Which of course delights me, but it's just just, just me. It's just part of what go, goes here. Years ago, my mother had given me what was called a funeral card. And I was so taken back by the words that was on the card and how sad it was that I was fascinated by it and then started hunting for them. And then from that point, it was pictures of death. And then somebody brought me a skull and somebody said, 
you know, hey, I have a coffin, would you be interested? And when I started this, which was probably 50 years ago now, nobody wanted to face death or have those things around. So it was quite available to me and everybody on the street, we were antique dealers, anybody who knew us would say, oh, Sue, I got something, you better come down here and see. So it was very easy to attain these things. This is a sad thing, but it's something that meant very much to a mother. This is little Gladys's dress, a little girl that died who was four years old. And her mother had folded this dress along with a note and her funeral card and it had left it. And it's been in my possession probably 60 years now, 50 or 60 years. And on her card, which shows an angel, it says, we had a little treasure once she was our joy and pride. We loved her all, perhaps too well, for soon she slept and died. All is dark within our dwelling. Lonely are our hearts today, for the one we love so dearly has forever passed away. Now that's sad. In my world, I always look for unusual things, and I think one of the most unusual things that I possess is a tear vial and this strange bottle, which is probably right about 1890, 1900, is a glass vial, and in it is a little slit, and as you were weeping for your loved one at the funeral, you held it to your eye, and you gathered your tears, then it sealed, and on the year anniversary of that person's death, you went to the grave and you would take it apart, open it up, and sprinkle your tears on the grave. I think things like that are beautiful and sad at the same point, but imagine people saving their tears for someone today. One of my prized possessions is called the Sad Hour. And the sad hour was a plaque they put on a coffin and they moved the hands of the clock to the hour of death. So if your husband died at six o'clock, the hands would have said six o'clock and that became the sad hour. Now that's kind of morbid. Sometimes they would rent you a half a coat because that's all you needed to see in the coffin or they'd rent you a half a dress. Of course, this one's Victorian. These are like 30s. They just, they're split up the back so they would fit the deceased and they only needed the upper part because it's all anybody could see. And my third most favorite thing, and, and I'm sorry it's not here, we can't bring it in due to the ceiling yet, but it's my hearse. This is a beautiful 1840s Amish built, horse-drawn hearse that has the original leather on top it's beveled glass, and it has curved glass on both ends that you can load the body one way or the other, and it's just spectacular. I have a boyfriend. I have to tell you about him. He's about six foot five, skinny as a rail, very creative, has done a lot for his society, but he's just beyond my approach, and his name is Jack Skellington. And I have a six foot figure of Jack Skellington, and I dance with him, and I can sing with him, and I can kiss him on the cheek, and nobody knows, but he's mine. Well, this is poor Flossie McGrews, and she's been here about 16 years. We sell costumes, vintage, and primarily anything that's ugly. I don't like anything that's modern. I don't sell slacks, I don't sell shorts, I don't sell t-shirts, I don't sell jeans, but anything that's really ugly or funky, I love it. And that's what we do here. We have a lot of fun. We try to have as much fun because you spend so many hours here that if it got real mundane and all beige, I think I would cry and not come back, but that's not the case. It's orange and black and noisy and people laugh and that makes me happy. I had never been in a Halloween costume shop in my life. And this was like about June, and this person kept telling me, 
you might do a lot of business. And I said, no, I, that will never happen. Well, my God, Halloween came. I had no idea the first year what was up, what was down. I hadn't prepared for it. I had to learn, I had to grow with the business because I'd never been in it. I've helped to create different things around the store, designing how we're going to place things around the store. I came and worked for her and pretty naive and not knowing the business and she has taken me under her wings. Halloween represents 80% of 87% of my salary per year, and I make it in 10 days. So I have to look at it from a business aspect that all my investments and all my efforts for a year have to be paid off. Hi. How are you today? Super. Can we help you find something? Exactly. A little cleavage? Exactly. Oh my heavens. <laughs> I should call Gina. She's into that. She's better than I am. Gina! Like this one's kind of renaissance looking. Yeah, it's not like oh, I love the element of fear. Children love the element of fear. You can always remember you were scared to death, but you can't kind of put your finger on that feeling. But it was kind of fun. And I worried that people's imagination have left them. And so it's a mystical, imaginary time for me in my mind. But in my heart, I'm excited. I love to see the spooky things, and I visit every place there is in this town that might sell something that's ugly that I can add to my collection. And I get to dream about bats, and the spooky movies are coming out, and that's important to me. A very, very tender side to her. Her animals are her life. Um, she can't handle an animal being hurt. These are my dog children. They're just hairy humans. And these puppies were all badly abused. And I had four, and I lost my spooky. And this is what's left, and we have DJ McGrew, Jakey McGrew, and Penny McGrew. Put those heads up, be pretty dogs. I had this dog, and he was very badly abused. And in the beginning, he would just stay under my bed. He would never come out. I'd have to read him books. I had to sit on the curbs so he could see cars in motion because it frightened him so much. And I would sit him every night, go get him out in front of the bed, make him sit and watch the news so he could hear just the voice. So that brought him a little bit out of his shell. And it took, I had Spooky almost seven years. And finally at the end, he was just, in, in the last five years, he was just wonderful. He learned that I wasn't gonna beat him, that I loved him and cared for him and he had totally come out of his shell. And then we found out he had cancer and I purified all his food and hand fed him and kept him alive for 60 days. He was a warrior. And then he passed on and I wasn't ready to let him go from my presence. So I put him in my freezer and then just last Sunday he left in a hearse and was cremated and brought back to me Tuesday. And now I have him in a box and I pat the box and he's going in a velvet bag and he's sort of special to me. But he's home now and I feel better. And, and um, I lost a great friend. My family was always in business when I was little. And of course, when you're in business, you don't have a lot of time for your child. But my uncle, who was my father's brother, lived with us. He was the most eccentric man in his time, I have to say that. And he taught me wonderful things on how to trap gophers and mouse traps and how we could skin them with one slice and pull the skin in a vise. Taught me how to collect snakes. And that's the kind of childhood I had. Every Saturday, we'd go down to Larmer Street and buy leather because my folks were in the artistic leather goods business. So him unknowingly and me unknowingly, he was teaching me. And he was teaching me about nature and why to look at this and why to do that. And I think I was a lonely child. 
I think that's what's happened to me because you had to live within your mind. There weren't other children to play with. My mother watched everything I did, so I couldn't, you know, get out of her sight. So you learn to occupy your, yourself, and you do that by occupying your mind. And, of course, my mind would wander, and this crazy uncle of mine and the lifestyle that I had, I came from dysfunction, I still live in dysfunction, and I can't imagine anybody not living in dysfunction. Once in my life, I've always been alone, but once in my life, I fell in love with someone. And I'd always protected myself. And this strange Portuguese fishmonger walked up the stairs and I looked at him and it was all over. Valentine's night, he moved in. About a week later, we got married. A week after that, my mother was livid. And about two years after that, I was divorced because I wouldn't move back east because I felt I needed the need for my family. But it's better because I wouldn't have this. I wouldn't have my freedom. I wouldn't have my life. All I'd have is a nasty old middle-aged man now that was growing at the middle, maybe drink beer and go fishing on weekends. That doesn't sound very exciting to me. I was blessed with this wonderful package from heaven called a son. And uh, my son is now 33, and I was always afraid that he couldn't handle society, but bless his heart, he's just as eccentric and even more so than I am, so I felt like I have accomplished something. Isn't that great for a mother to say, I have an accomplishment in my son. He's a wonderful eccentric, and he is. Should I ever finish this house? And when I come here, I see myself growing older more gracefully than I could in a normal subdivision. It will be extreme. It will have my total personality here. It will have all my worldly goods here but it offers me something more than that, and that's the spiritual comfort that I can't find other places. And I always say I bought the dying lady on Sherman Street. And now we're a pair of dying ladies on Sherman Street, but with support of each other, I think we'll overcome and she'll be a fine lady. And I can stand in the door and wave to everybody as they go down the street and laugh like hell and just say, I did it, I did it. I do have a lonely lifestyle, but it's of choice that I'm alone. And I guess it's part selfishness because not everybody deserves to share in my, in my wonderful world. And on the other token, it's fear because I don't, what if I shared it with somebody and I, I became attached to that person? So I share it with my dogs, the true me I share with my dogs. And they're probably the only ones that really know me. They always say churches are built on sacred ground. So I'm going to have my ashes and Spooky's ashes sprinkled below the church and the great dwelling downstairs. Because this is a great, there's a peacefulness here and this is where I'm coming to die.